First of all, happy International Women's Day <laughs> to all the incredible, powerful, inspirational, caring and supportive women here and those in our lives, past, present and future. Yesterday was the culmination of the Miracles Day, Miracles Days, and so Miracle is in the air, <laughs> at least for me. Miracles is in the air, at least for me. So I wanted to share a not very uh, difficult to imagine miracles, but somewhat towards that direction from this gem of a book recalling so many of very privately shared incidents, insights, happenings in the lives, in the life of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So uh, the first one I wanted to share is something that I couldn't locate <laughs> this morning. So I'm going to share it from my heart, from what I remember having come across this. Uh, that has to do with His Holiness's empowerment that he prepared us for, so some of us who have taken the empowerment last night. Uh, that was the preparatory ritual for Chakra Samura empowerment in the Krishnacharya tradition, lineage. And His Holiness, as those of you who may have watched it, uh, remember very clearly in the course of his teaching yes, last night, at least for us last night, uh, he recalled how close he felt to this Indian adept Acharya, Krishna Acharya. Uh, and along with that, there's another figure, not in the line of the Dalai Lamas, someone outside of it, who founded Jindipung Monastery, Jamyang Chuji, Tashi a contemporary disciple of Tsongkhapa. So connected with these two, His Holiness has shared his personal kind of immediate sense of closeness, of affinity with them. and. Uh, not that this is the whole story around it, but uh, as a related snippet, snippet uh, on this, uh, he sh shared with the author, the late Ratu Chong Rinpoche, a very trusted uh, student of His Holiness, as well as himself, a very good, not only scholar, but a very good practitioner to the very end of his life. Such an exemplary, and most exemplary of his qualities is his humility. So humble, he was. He would hardly be noticed when he's going around. And yet, at the same time, he's filled with wisdom, knowledge, whatnot, and it sparkles in the course of this book. Be that knowledge on the Tibetan literature, uh, Tibetan poetry, uh, because there are some personal poetry he has come up with in relation to his holiness. Uh, so. So in this, uh, he shares uh, one incident where His Holiness uh, happened to be in Depung in South India. And uh, usually, every time His Holiness visits Depung, he would uh, always have some special uh, dreams. Maybe it has to do with the connection going long back in time, because Depung has been the residence of the second Dalai Lama since from, from the second Dalai Lama up until the fifth Dalai Lama when he then eventually moved to central Tibet uh, with the uh, political power that he uh, obtained. And he retained the same name of the, you may call 
Lama Hold, not household, Lama Hold. <laughs> Lao Frang, uh, at Jepum called Ganden Potang, he uh, uh, used that same for the Tibetan government. So the government has since then been called Ganden Potang. So on one of these visits, His Holiness had, had this dream of the, of the contemporary abbots of Debung and other dignitaries uh, kind of coming together for a meeting. And there he very clearly specifies, there he, in, in the course of sharing this, he says that uh, there was a Gomang abbot who used to be in Australia and other countries. And he was the one who pointed out that Jamyang Chuji is still not present for the meeting. At that time, His Holiness was there, but the, the abbot was saying, Jamyang Chuji, who founded Depung, could not be together. Of course, there are years, decades, centuries apart. Uh, but somehow, they were expecting him to be in the meeting and was saying, and they were saying that he's not yet present. Let's wait for him. And at that, at that time, in the dream, His Holiness felt like, what is he speaking about? Samyapa is here. I'm him. Samyapa means someone from Samye. So that came up so naturally in him and saying, Samyapa is here. I'm him. And maybe they don't recognize me, so maybe I should keep quiet. So that's how the dream passed. And, and this, he clearly mentions that it occurs sometime in the dawn. Which, uh, which is the time period when you kind of, uh, at, at least in the Buddhist literature, we say these dreams are more likely to be true, right? So then His Holiness referred this to Ling Rinpoche, his senior tutor. So his, and then Ling Rinpoche replied back saying, oh, that's so interesting because Jamyang Chuje Tashi Pandan indeed was from Samye. He was born in Samia, and during his time, he was, uh, in short forms, he used to be called the one from Samia, Samiapa. And, and not just this, I've come across several other uh, sharings that his audience did, uh, one with a Western student of him. In an interview, he uh, recalled being more close to Jamyang Chuje uh, than, than maybe some of the Dalai Lamas, but uh, and uh, that he felt to be a continuation of Jamyam Shuji. That and the other Indian adept from among the 80 Sid Siddhas, uh, Krishnacharya, His Holiness shared it last night several times, saying how I felt close to him whereas the empowerment of this he had received in Tibet and had also done the long uh, retreat, all of them, in terms of giving the empowerment, last night might be the first ever by his holiness, uh, despite the fact that he had always felt this affinity. And because of this, uh, when the late Nyingma master, Tushi Rinpoche, uh, was uh, asked to compose, a, to compose a recitation, to compose a Tungrap life stories of His Holiness. His Holiness specifically instructed him to include. Uh, Jaryan Chuji used to be included, maybe, before, but Krishna never appeared in the series of birth stories of His Holiness. So these come in a versical form, in verse form, and these are recited as a way of salutation. But expanded forms will come in much more longer lengthy forms, but these are a recitational form. So we had in, uh, specifically instructed him to include Krishna Shah and also make sure Tashi Pandan, Yamyan Chuchi Tashi Pandan is India. So something is going on <laughs> beyond what meets our eyes. <laughs> beyond what we can what we can consider to be the real uh, reality. 
And then there's another, another I would call sharing here or revelation here. When His Holiness with his small entourage were on their way to exile into India. And once they landed uh, in the safe place of India and then entered into the border, they came to Mon, Mon, Mon Tawang in Arunachal Pradesh. And there is the Tawang Gumba, a very historic and uh, famous monastery around that area. Still very, very active and fun very functional. So, so there, this incidence of His Holiness passing through Tawang on his exile seemed to have been predicted by the sixth Dalai Lama, who was born in Tawang and who had to wait long until he was, I don't know, officially, at least unofficially recognized as the reincarnation of the fifth Dalai Lama. But the reason why it got kind of uh, pushed away was the then regent of the late uh, fifth Dalai Lama had to keep his passing away a secret so that no disruptions would come and then so many unfinished projects would be carried out. So he had to have someone kind of uh, stay mostly indoors in the Patala and not really make uh, any occasion for uh, personal and audience on one Protects or the other, or being on a very long retreat. But somehow, if people were to really wonder and care, look, they could see some movement, some uh, uh, signs of life there <laughs> with, with the Tatin Dalai Lama look alike. Uh, but the, no. so, uh, anyway, that's how for 10, 15 years it got pushed. Pardon? Oh, okay. So, yeah, that part I'm not. not <laughs> Clear. So 25 years. So, so by the time he he got, I don't know officially, but unofficially recognizes the sixth Dalai Lama being when the secret got out, and they had to wonder about who, where the reincarnation might happen. So he got uncared for, yet at the same time showing signs of his speciality and whatnot. And almost at one point, uh, he got recognized or, re or instituted as the reincarnation of a Shalu master. Shalu, by the way, is an offshoot of Sakya, or a subsect of Sakya, or like Shijie is. So, so in their attempt, he he was about to be. Uh, invited away uh, to Shalu Monastery. At that time, he uh, took time to kind of uh, pause a little bit and look back to his native place and happened to be landing on a flat stone. And there he said, yes, before I go too far, I should have a look, last time look to my place. And yes, why not have milk? And also, why not have some booze? <laughs> and he did that while standing and with his left leg facing one side and the other right, le right leg facing another direction, one towards Tibet, one towards his native land. And uh, he sang this spiritual song, which I have just roughly translated, <laughs> so that it will save time. <laughs> Upon a flat stone of Tudi, which is the place, the specific spot, I left unmistakable footprints with a toe facing, in, facing my native land, the, the, of, of the right foot, foot. An auspicious condition is created for us to meet again. 
the three locales of Laok of Mon, which is his actual birthplace, since he has already moved a little further away, but he was looking towards that. The three locales of Laok of Mon, Mon is similar in its formation to a golden trough. In the heart of this trough of gold, there are formed some high and low land masses. At the top of these high masses, high points, lotus flowers are blossoming. So he did indicate that, yeah, sometime there will be a meeting, re-meeting, reunion. And not only that, Yeah, not only that, there, yeah, there in his uh, birthplace, just near to that, uh, he planted what might have been uh, intended to use as a walking stick, but maybe a just live, lively cut stick. So he kind of puts it in the ground. And in a way, planted it. And he said that when this grows up, high up, high as a high as the roof of this house, uh, yeah, when this will grow and its height will be equal to this house, this house's roof, uh, I'll come back to moon. And uh, and then indeed he did come back in the form of the Fourteenth Dalai Lama in 1959 on his way. To to India on a flight, and at that time, that plant has actually grown as tall as the uh, roof of that house. Not only that, it is very f famously known for its medicinal qualities. Medicinal qualities, in a way, they use their leaves for boiling into water and then use as a, a preventive measure for health issues like cough, uh, cold, etc. And also it is considered to be uh, very, uh, very effective. So much so that they would call that uh, tree as the Ujjenling Cha. So I don't know why it is called Ujjenling. Maybe because he took to Vajrayana practice and outwardly went into the crazy wisdom um, uh, uh, master's behavior were not that we are uh, surprising to some some kind of questionable etc. Uh, so so maybe that has to do with how it is called Ujenling, uh, but it is called the Ujenling's uh, hand stick. That the central wood it is called central wood, not because it is a central wood, but uh, out of reverence of its. And then there is another story connecting the thirteen, the, the sixth Dalai Lama, to the fifth Dalai Lama, to the third, to the fourteenth Dalai Lama. There is this statue here, a copper gilded with gold statue, uh, and this is the back of it, and uh, with 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 dagam on, <laughs> the winter overcoat on, and there. Uh, on the back side, uh, on the cushion, it's, it, it, it roughly says that at the request of this family, I, the sixth Dalai Lama, by the name of Losang Rinzin Changyang Gyasu, uh, uh, write this prayer as, in, as requested by these families uh, on the back of the statue of the Fifth Dalai Lama was, uh, yeah, on the, on the back of the statue of the Fifth Dalai Lama. So somehow, Ratu Kyongla Rinpoche happened to possess this because some Westerners, it says a, a wealthy Westerner a lady uh, by the name of, um, yeah, who, who is a famous artist by the name of Charmion, Charmion. I'm just supposing this is she, but it doesn't say exactly. It is Rinpoche's sponsor, Ari, American 
famous artist by the name of Charmion. Okay, uh, he the artist gave this statue to his uh, to Rato Rinpoche. So on one of his visits to New York, uh, to on one of his Holiness's visit to New York, uh, Rinpoche brought it up to uh, His Holiness and uh, and showed him. Not to offer it back to his holiness. He wanted it. <laughs> but he just kind of showed it off, say, see what I have? <laughs> and, he, and his holiness, and he, and he uh, did uh, offer his holiness to keep it for one night, if he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when he did, the next morning he went back to get it. He has to really make sure he gets it before his holiness, and the whole entourage leaves New York City. And then you, <laughs> that's what I'm making up. <laughs> but somehow he made sure he returned back to the hotel the next day and uh, just wondered what His Holiness had to say. His Holiness said that he had a dream of Sangyang Gyaso and identifying him, himself with him so closely. And there it very clearly says, mm, yeah. Very clearly said, the next morning at dawn, when His Holiness was half asleep, half awake, he had a dream of his identifying with uh, Sikh Dalai Lama. And because of who Sikh Dalai Lama happened to be, and in terms of his outward appearance and his conducts and whatnot, His Holiness even felt a sense of embarrassment, uh, deep inside in, in, being, in finding himself one with him. <laughs> yeah, but then, at that moment, His Holiness handed Ratu Chongla Rinpoche a complete mass, or com complete of his hair he had just had cut that morning, maybe. Or, so he offered it the whole hair to Radu Chongla Rinpoche. And let me see. And yes, and consented that this could be inside, this could sit inside the statue. So Radu Chongla Rinpoche not only got his statue back, but also got a handful of His Holiness's holy hair. And he put it into it through all the uh, proper uh, rituals, rites, etc. And then when His Holiness came back, which seems to be either late that same year, 2003, or the next year, 2004, because in the way it, 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 it is written in Tibetan, it only says Chilo, Chilo Ter, that Western year. Or it could be the Chi could be read, uh, read as next year. So. That's uh, not so clear, but it could be either the same year, 2003 or 2004, when he went back with the statue and then asked His Holiness to consecrate it. Again, he was very sure that, not, that, the, that he got the statue back, so he asked for consecration. Nothing but consecrate, so then I could get it back consecrated. <laughs> so again, uh, and then, yeah, when uh, the statue was consecrated and was returned back the next day. His Holiness uh, laughingly said, uh, here, here you go, right? Here you go uh, with a statue of the fifth Dalai Lama uh, having the uh, prayer inscription uh, by the sixth Dalai Lama with the hair, uh, yeah, in uh, hair uh, being put in it with the consecration by the 14th Dalai Lama, with the statue being handed over to you. <laughs> so he laughingly uh, get that back. So then uh, there's one story I wanted to share. Uh, I mean, that kind of gives us some idea of to what extent this always goes in what we call uh, preserving the Dharma. Somehow this is also related with something miraculous. Uh, 
at least to some extent. In that, in Tibetan tradition, we I have noticed uh, the masters really paying uh, serious attention to the fact uh, of uh, retaining the transmissions and really exploring whether there is an extent transmission line somewhere that it could be had like that. So it may be in preparation to His Holiness eventual teaching of the 18 Lamrim text maybe uh, that uh, uh, that uh, yeah. among them one of the texts uh, by the Shamar Penteta, Kendin Tenzin Yasu, uh, which happens to be a very lengthy uh, description and treat what you call uh, um, exposition on the very hard points in Tsongkhapa's Lak Tung Chamo chapter. And so His Holiness uh, inquired around and didn't find anyone in the exile community who carries the transmission of it. But he, he was still hopeful that he might find it. And eventually he found out that it might be possible that someone in Tibet, in Amdo area, may be holding it. And then he had a connection with Geshe Takpa Gyasu in Tibet, and through secret lines, uh, sent the masses to look for uh, a transmission, if it is ever being kept by anyone, and then bring it back to him and pass it on to him. So they looked around and they found uh, a, a hermit who had, since Cultural Revolution had gone up into the wood, in, into, the, into the mountains, into the caves, and was just kind of uh, had no connection uh, with the lo local locality, to, with the local people. Because the Chinese, when they see it, then they, they will see they're supporting uh, the poisonous dharma. <laughs> Yet at the same time, Chinese were quite open in, in even during in the very thick of the Cultural Revolution and the aggression, that uh, if, as a practitioner, you could sustain yourself without depending on anyone, then you're off the hook. <laughs> We're not going to bother you. So they really challenged. And they really challenged those who are in the prison, saying, OK, feed yourself. Ask triple gem for food. That's what you rely on. And I remember very clearly His Holiness bringing this up, saying, in a way, the Chinese are true. Dharma is not supposed to feed you. Dharma is not supposed to clothe you. Then you have to work for yourself. Dharma is there to make, bring peace to mind. And then through that, the transformation, and then the transformation around yourself in how you deal with things. But nonetheless, there were some, including the Depung Lamrim, Kishi Lamrim, as well as this, this master. Uh, they called Aku, yeah, they called Aku Tenzin Gyaso, who was around 102, 3, 4, like that, at that time. And he had been in the, in the caves for so long, and he was, in, he was completely unconnected with the local people. He was not dependent at all. So partly the Chinese didn't have any pretext to kind of harm him. No. Uh, did they see any point? Because if he's able to sustain through, through this, and that's good. And in a way, that's a very strong challenge against their uh, position as well. So they rather keep him uh, untouched. So that's how he was living. In the summer, he would just sustain himself, support himself with the leaves and yeah, or the wild uh, plants. And then in winter, uh, he would uh, sustain on uh, pills of red earth, red soil, that he would have consecrated into what, what we usually call rasayana extraction, which is the extraction of essence or extraction of nutrients for health and longevity. So he was able to sustain himself like that. So this Geshe, Geshe Dagwaji, so he eventually went up and found out that he did have uh, the, he did carry the transmission. So he asked him, without revealing that this is coming from His Holiness, 
He revealed. He just asked him once and twice as though it is for himself. The master rejected. Then eventually he had to reveal that, yes, this is a request for His Holiness. He had asked me to look around and I found you carrying it. Please give. Then he relented. He gave the whole transmission. And soon after the transmission was finished, he passed away. At that time he was 106. And then this Geshe, Takwajasu, sneaked out of Tibet into India, into Dharamsala, into very close door togetherness with His Holiness and passed it on. So with this, I'm again very sorry, I've been long too long, but I couldn't resist the air of miracles in me and the time of BBC sharing with you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Yeah, when, when he was giving the Lamrim 18, he, that this text was included. Okay, because I remember him, I remember him talking about the text and quoting some passages, but I wasn't sure if he gave the lung for it, but he did. <laughs> so the uh, point here, the, the, the challenge here is really find out the timeline, but it seems like it had happened quite long ago. So, which means by the time he was giving the 18 uh, Lamrim text transmission, uh, he, that was in that. Because when he was talking about that text during, you know, mm -hmm. and the points that, that Shama Rinpoche was bringing, I was going, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, that's so very cool. incredible, very, very uh, remarkable text that he was desperate to get. Uh, the lung, if at all it was uh, existing. So another point I wanted to point about this is the one who wrote, the author, is Shamar Tenzin Jaso. The one who happened to be holding the transmission at last is also Agu Tenzin Jaso. And then through Gishe Dagwa Jaso, who it was then passed on to is His Holiness Tenzin Jaso. <laughs> Triple tens in Jasso's blessing. Thank you.